Hi, everyone. This is Jason Verlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal. This is the Fretboard Journal's 90-second podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. You guys are in for a treat today. Last month, on the weekend of November 6th through 8th, 2015, the Fretboard Journal held its first ever Fretboard Summit in Northern California. This was our attempt to bring the pages of the Fretboard Journal magazine to life. We invited some of our favorite people from the first 10 years of publishing, some truly incredible artists as well as artisans, some of our favorite builders and collectors and dealers and historians. And we took over this entire resort, this resort called Costa Noa near Santa Cruz. It was an incredibly magical and powerful weekend for me. I'm not a new agey guy at all, but to see Bill Frizzell talking to David Crosby for the first time, to see all of these great builders talking to each other, talking to their fans, to see 300 fretboard journal readers come from around the world um, to our event was a incredibly moving thing for me. And uh, the entire weekend was filled with all sorts of little magical moments. Thanks to the support and sponsorship of uh, all the folks behind the summit, but especially in the case of these videos and podcasts, Paul Reed Smith Guitars, um, we're going to be able to share a lot of these moments with you guys. Paul Reed Smith was our video and podcast sponsor. They were also on hand. Paul was there and gave a great talk uh, and showed off some of his latest and greatest uh, acoustics and electrics. And this talk that you are about to hear was one of the moments that resonated with a lot of people who were on the site. Um, Joe Henry and David Crosby, two very amazing, iconic musicians, two former fretboard journal subjects, um, decided to talk about the art of record production. This could have been a very dry talk um, about engineering and knob twiddling, but it turned into a really moving conversation about uh, why records are made and how they're made, why records are important, and uh, how a musician focuses on their craft. Uh, a lot of people wish this went on for three hours. It went on for an hour. Uh, next year, we're going to plan accordingly and give some of these things a little more breathing room. But I was really glad that we were able to capture this moment and that both David and Joe could pull this off. I can't thank them enough. Um, you will be hearing the applause as they were introduced by Mark Stepman of Folkway Music. And then you will hear the conversation. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any feedback or questions or comments, don't hesitate to write me at jason at fretboardjournal.com. I'm all ears. And if you need anything for the uh, holidays that are coming up very quickly, uh, don't forget Fretboard Journal subscriptions for all those loved ones and friends who are way into guitars. We've worked none of this out. Perfect. Yeah. None. Um, and we would, all, I, I would assume we want to leave a few minutes for questions because um, in these situations, usually the best questions come from uh, listeners. So actually, I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. You guys usually have the worst questions. Um, <laughs> but we will try to uh, at least set the stage and find out what you might find interesting. But we thought we might talk about record production a little bit. Just because we, I think both of us and David's history, obviously, um, he's much farther up the, the food chain and totem pole oh, than I am. Bullshit. Um, bullshit. But we were talking uh, through email a little bit before we got here um, about the idea of, you know, we all write a song, we perform a song, you put a microphone in front of it, and you might come out with something that's an artifact, a relic, um, some kind of representation of a moment. But the idea of making records is making a recording that will stay engageable, that will stay fluid. And we go back to records. I know I'm listening to the same records I've been listening to for 40 years of my life, if not more. Um, you know, and they stay a living thing. And what is it that, you know, what is it that happens that makes a recording a living thing that evolves along with you if you meet it at the table? Um, so we thought we might talk about that for a few moments and. I was n not wanting to pregame this, but I did think that if I thought of a question to ask David, it might just open us up. So if David will allow me, I would just ask you. Um, I was revisiting your very seminal first solo album in preparation for this trip. And I wanted to ask you, when you were writing those songs, 
uh, it's very sonically ambitious. It's a, it's an ambitious production. And I wondered if the idea for what that record should sound like and the environment, did it inspire the songs that you would write or were the songs you were writing in that moment, did they tell you that you had to go somewhere else than you had been? You know, I hadn't pre-thought anything about those songs. I didn't even know that I was making a solo record. Uh, I'm very unorganized. Um, <clears throat> songs just come to me. I try to write them every day. I pick up a guitar every day. Uh, sit down with a keyboard or sit down and have a pad and pencil next to the bed. You know, I mean, you take it seriously. You, you just sort of have to treat them like they're a gift, you know, and you want to have the doors open and the windows open and say, if the muse is coming by, you want to say, hey, hello, I'm paying attention. And I was. Uh, I'd gone through a really terrible time in my life there. Uh, and we had just made Deja Vu. And uh, the studio was really the only place I felt safe. Right then. It's the only place I knew what to do with myself. So I stayed in there. I could afford to, and I just did. Uh, Wally Hodgers in San Francisco. And people would come by. Garcia almost every night. Uh, different people from all those bands. And uh, I had these songs, and it was the most unorganized approach to recording I've ever had. But it was very dedicated. You know, we were, we'd, I'd play them the song, and then we'd play it two, three times, four times. And something would either happen or it wouldn't. It was not organized. But we got, we had paid her repeatedly. It's not <clears throat> the way to go about it. It's too haphazard. You should play the songs a lot before you go in the studio, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that Joe and I agreed about right away, and I, I would say this as, just as a basic to making records, is that you have to have a song. You have to be able to have a song that you sit down with somebody with a guitar or a piano or whatever instrument you like and make them feel something. If you don't have that, all the production in the world doesn't mean shit. You're polishing a turd. It's just not there. You you have to have a song that really has something to say, that means something to you, makes you feel something. Then the object is to catch it the way he said in a clear enough form to where it will keep talking to you. You should be able to listen to a song 10 years later and hear shit you didn't hear the first time if it's produced really well. You know, you listen to, I mean, I don't know how many thousand times I've listened to Asia. I can listen to it right now and hear something I didn't hear the first time. Because that's how well produced it was. Because they layered it carefully enough and honestly enough to where it does what he said. It still speaks to you. Producing is really hard, though. Uh, the reason he's produced so many more than I have is that it takes as much time to produce a song as it does to make your own record. You, know, you produce somebody else's record, well, it takes a while if you want to do it right. Uh, I'm so selfish, I'm always running off to make my own record instead of producing somebody else's. But I don't know if I answered your question. But answered it for me. Okay. <laughs> Satisfied me. Well, I would just add to that that, you know, almost everything I produce, and I've produced a, a, a pretty wide and varied uh, group of people. I don't operate in a particular genre. I'm not that... Uh, faithful to anything. And David was just using the word attention. It reminded me, I just heard the interview um, with poet Mary Oliver, who said that paying attention is the beginning of devotion. And the idea of being devoted to something where it doesn't have to represent you, um, you stand to represent it. And I noticed that making a record because I don't have any preconceived notions. I don't want to think about what a song is supposed to be when we go into a studio. I make the most skeletal demos I could possibly make. I encourage people not to make, you know, overly produced demos. You know, I just want to know the architecture of the song. This is its shape. These are its words, if it has words. You know, this is, this is, it's melodic 
integrity. Otherwise, I don't want anybody thinking until we're in that moment about what might happen, because there's a moment of discovery that happens in the first few times when people you invite four or five people into a room together that haven't been together before in this particular configuration, this particular moment, and you put a song on the floor that you believe in, and I agree completely. I don't want anybody bringing a song forward that they don't completely feel invested in, because as soon as you hit the wall, you start questioning the song. You look for something to, well, maybe the song is not strong enough. You need to believe in it enough that you're not questioning, you know, it's Compass Blade that's saying, walk in this direction so you can fearlessly start walking. But there's always a moment of, of you know, when a song really gets revealed. And that's what I want to happen in front of microphones. I personally don't believe in pre-production. I would never encourage anybody to go rehearse in the studio as a unit and then have discovered the song and then, okay, now we go to the studio and read it into the public record. You know, we're going to reenact it for the microphones now because it already happened. You know, when that moment happens, there's a moment like a seance when a song stands up and identifies itself. Um, you know, no matter how haggard it may appear, how beautiful or how smeared the lipstick might be. Um, that's the moment I want to hear. And that's what brings me back to it. When something sounds viscerally alive and you're not picturing, you know, I, I can hear a, a current record that was made, you know, a month ago and it already, already sounds like a, like a relic to me. I put it on, I just picture people with headphones on and I don't ever want to do that. You know, I want, a, I want a song to be like a movie I can disappear into. But I started to say that almost invariably, if I hit a wall with anybody um, trying to find a song, trying to conjure it into the room, you know, I, the one thing I will say to an artist or to myself, you know, um, it's not about you, it's about it. You can't be thinking about this and how, how does it make you look as a singer? How do I look as a guitar player? It's like, am I offering this song whatever it needs to stand up so that I can move away from it and go on and do something else now? Um, and obviously you work with really different kind of artists. Every artist needs something different, um, except the game is always exactly the same. You know, how do you make something meaningful come out of a pair of speakers so that you're not thinking that you're just willing to kind of follow it um, forever? I mean, I really do put on, you know, David mentioned a song. I, I you know, I can still put on uh, and do, you know, Madam George and listen to it uh, endlessly. And I still, you know, the mystery is not dispelled, you know. A song is built on mystery. All art is built on mystery, you know. Blues music is based in the deepest mystery. And our job is not to ever dispel mystery, but to abide it, um, join it, um, li live in it. Um, so it's not about, you know, being on the grid. Is, every, is everybody playing in the same time? Does anything fall off? Does anybody slip out of tune? Does anybody's voice break? It's just, does it break in the right way? Does it break in the way that breaks your heart? And then it's, it's not about, is it a mistake? Is it not a mistake? It's like, you know, was there drama that made me feel something alive in that song and that I recognized in myself when I heard it? Um, Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. Sure. You need to uh, try to make a space in which... <clears throat> magic can happen. Anything less than that is really mundane, really just cranking it out. Uh, if you're looking for the peaks, if you're looking for something that'll be startlingly beautiful, you have to, as he said, don't walk in with the whole tune sketched out. Walk in knowing the song, but don't play it together a whole bunch. Wait until you get in the moment. Relax a whole lot. Lay back. Let it happen. <clears throat> it's the magic that can happen between some people in a room, really listening to each other, is what we're after. That's the shit. And that's what we want. You, you go a lot of takes ever? I never do. Uh, pretty rarely. I mean, I think somewhere between like, you know, one or two and five takes. You know, there's a real moment in there where it, when people are playing in a room together, and that's pretty much the only way I work. I mean, I'm not saying that's for everybody. Not everybody makes records that way. That's me too. But, but when I want to hear the weather in the room, I want to hear, you know, I know that, that the drums sound a particular way because they're hitting the piano mics on the other side of the room and it's describing space. It's describing proximity between people. And if what you're wanting to hear is the sound of people 
meeting at a table, you know, the clearest way to that place is to actually, guess what, you know, invite people to a table and something happens. Um, I don't want to be too mystical about it, but it is mystical. If you get yourself out of the way, but it, it insists that you not show up, you know, I mean, maybe it works for Prince. I think it does. He, he <laughs> thinks, you know, he has a song and he says, there's one way that this goes. And if you can't give me what I need, I'll do it myself or I'll get somebody else in here. But I know how this goes. Um, I am not Prince. Uh, I, uh, there's all kind of ways a song might be successful. You know, I make albums almost invariably, almost everything I produce is recorded over three to five days. That's it. Um, when I was producing Solomon Burke um, in 2002, we made a record that was sort of a, a resurfacing for him. And I had a lot of journalists uh, say, I can't believe you made that record in four days. And my response was, six days would have been a disaster. You know, <laughs> any more time... He would have run the whole thing off the rails. You know, the more confident he got with what he thought was going to happen, the more he tried to take apart what had happened. So only because of the urgency of this moment did we get what we got. And I understood that when you invite people in and there's really, you know, there's a moment right now. This song comes on the floor. There's a moment that this song gets revealed. And if you got anything to say about this song, say to it or for it, now's the time. We're not experimenting with this so that, you know, three weeks from now, somebody's not going to come in and try a different bass part. We are finding this song now, and we're going to commit to it, you know, with our full hearts now. When people understand that, there's a second, third take where people understand the architecture, but no one's doing anything by rote. Nobody is sure enough about what anybody else is going to do that they're listening with such incredible intensity that they're not just thinking about what they're doing. The drummer's not just listening back and thinking about what the drums are doing. They're thinking about, you know, have we conjured something alive into the room that, that is, you know, irresistible, that will seduce us back into its uh, presence, um, f you know, forever. They're in a, a heightened state of awareness of each other mm -hmm. at that moment. They're listening intensely to each other. And that's when you get good stuff. There are <clears throat> a lot of problems with producing uh, the acoustic environment, the ability of the engineer. You, you have to pick really carefully. You know, you know a room has a sweet spot for drums, then you know that you like using that room, and you know you want to put the drums there and mic them this way. You know that a good engineer can do can catch what you're trying to make the space for in that room. One of the toughest things, most of the records that I have been producer or co-producer on have been in a band. And then you get a terrible thing. Opinions. <laughs> you get a lot of opinions. If you're in that band, you get a ton of opinions. I've been in a band with some very strong-willed people. <laughs> I think that was a nice way to put it. <laughs> Perfect. It's kind of a euphemism, yeah. but, you know, there you go. Uh, and uh, when I started out, we didn't get to have opinions. When I was in the Birds, uh, we were on Columbia, and they were still a union engineer situation. We were not allowed to touch the board. They would take a break in the middle of you getting really <laughs> something good. <laughs> we, we left that as quickly as we could. But... In a band like CSN or CSNY, you know, you can say, look, it, it needs to, you know, and all I credit where it's due, all the guys that I work with really understand what he's been talking about, this, making this, walking in with something in the first place that they, that they can sit down and sing you and you go, yeah, I get that. I like that. I want a piece of that. Um, <clears throat> and then making it happen at that early stage when there's almost, it's almost tactile in the room. You, you can sort of feel everybody in the room, you know, going, ah, but, oh, mm. and they're kind of like launching themselves off a cliff into it. When it's that dangerous, that unplanned, that's when, that's the shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's tough if you're doing it with a, a group of people, all of whom have strong opinions. Um, Particularly if one of them's Neil. Uh. 
I'm just saying, you know, it's just. Uh, but all of us, all of us, you know, made a lot of records. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a problem. It's a problem if they want to revisit the thing and think about it too much. That's what he was talking about with Solomon Burke. If Solomon Burke had been allowed to think about it enough over a period of time, he would have changed a lot of shit that, would, that was right the first time. And that's a, that's a problem. We all do it. It's not like it's his fault. It's everybody does it. You listen to it and you go, wow, man, maybe a little tambourine in the fast part. You know, and it doesn't need the tambourine in the fast part. You're just overthinking the process, right? Mm. Frequently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you run into this, right? Well, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with a lot of so called um, legacy artists, um, people who are, you know, already on the mountain at the point that I met them and, you know, coming into a room with somebody that I've admired my entire adult life and before. Um, I mean, uh, Mavis, Alan Toussaint, Billy Preston, uh, Harry Belafonte, um, uh, Jimmy Scott, um, a bunch. Um, and try to think, you know, how do I help them find something that is authentic to them, you know, without without looking backward. You know, how do you honor their legacy and help them not be trapped by it? And I think people who have made records for a really long time, especially if they've been successful and very much exalted for what they have done and what that means to people, you know, how do you allow them and encourage them and support them to do something that will still be authentic to them, but is, you know, speaking in the present tense? And... I work really hard to keep people, um, I mean, I think that the, that the real job of a producer, and it's different for different artists, but, but the goal is, you know, how do you allow people to feel fearless? You know, if people feel fearless, they will give you everything they got. They will open a vein for you, uh, for themselves. If, they, if they're assured that n nothing that they need to do is going to make them feel foolish in front of anybody in the room, in front of anybody once we leave the room, that... You know, they can go out on that wire and see, you know, I know how to do this. I've always done this and this works and people like to hear that. But I, something tells me that I need to go another step out of this circle because the song insists on it. This moment insists on it. And there's something really beautiful about pe keeping people um, supported and also slightly disoriented, you know, where you don't. You don't believe that you know what's about to happen. And I surround myself almost always, because I, I have certainly produced bands that exist as bands, but more often than not, I'm working with a, an artist who's a solo you know, presence, and I'm asked to sort of populate the room around them. And I, I have a network of people, a, a nucleus of people that I pull from a lot, who are really beautiful at listening and going you know, wherever this moment might go. Um, but how do you keep people sort of out of the solution business, um, out of thinking that that I already know how this concludes and, I, and I'm going to walk there right now? Out of their comfort you know, zone. I'll see you on the other side of the room. You know, um, How do you keep people listening so deeply to what the song means to say, not what they mean to say, um, that the song takes over? And in the course of three or four takes, a song you believe lived over here and looked like this, all of a sudden identifies itself on the other side of the room looking completely different. But there it is, vividly alive, saying, no, you thought I, I, I was this, but I, I actually live over here. And this is the kind of blood that runs through my veins. To me, that's what's really exciting about making records. Once you have those moments and you can step away from them, they always exist. Um, but it's really tricky to prepare yourself for any possibility and to, to be a good shepherd for anybody who's invited you to be one um, and and try to keep yourself from pre-gaming anything deciding this is how this song goes and this is what it feels like and these are the instruments that we're going to use because once you begin um, there really is no telling if you if you're dedicated to 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 discovery um, and I, I've said to myself many times and to anybody who would listen that personally I'm not really that, that interested in self-expression in in regard to Here's an idea I've already had, uh, and it's so important that I need to put it in three verses that rhyme so that you can share it with me and take it away with you. Um, what I want to record is discovery, um, not something that I've 
you know, already sort of solved, not a cube I've already solved in my room somewhere. Um, song you, is a map. Don't you feel often that involves getting that artist out of their comfort zone? Oh, sure. That's why, I mean, as an example, um, I was just making a record a few weeks ago, and our dear friend who I believe is in the room, Bill Frizzell, was, was with us as well. I was producing Alan Toussaint, the patriarch of New Orleans music who is still with us. I've done a lot of work with Alan in the last 10 years. And we were making a record uh, with him a few weeks ago in, in Los Angeles. Um, it was all music that he'd never played before. Uh, I mean, he's a heroically great songwriter. He's in the, you know, the Hall of Fame already. But I'd ask him to sort of be a piano interpreter and I'd ask him to play um, Ellington and Strayhorn pieces and Fats Waller pieces and uh, Bill Evans and things like that. And I put people in the room, Bill among them, uh, Charles Lloyd, the great tenor saxophonist, and all of it was new to Alan. And he was clearly uncomfortable. I mean, he was uncomfortable. He tried to leave the project two weeks before we began, <laughs> even though we've been talking about this record for six years since we made the last one. Um, he was completely unnerved. And he asked me before we started. Literally, he sat me down and he was flustered and he said, what's going to happen? And I said, well, I, I don't know, but I, I know it will be beautiful. That's what I know, is that between us in the room, we will find a way for this to be alive. How can we not? Um, I love everybody and everybody and, and their approach. I love this music. There's no way that it's not going to become alive in front of us if, we, if that's our goal. We don't have to know in what way it would be beautiful. Um, I don't want to stray too far off, but it reminds me of, if any of you know who Buckminster Fuller was. If you don't, you should find out. Um, Bucky Fuller told some architecture students in the 60s, forget about making things pretty. Put it out of your mind. <clears throat> if you design something that is realizable for the people who need it, it's affordable to them, you can't miss beauty. It will be beautiful. If it answers its call, it will be beautiful. And I think that way about a song. Um, there's all kind of ways a song can work, and it can be the, the grungiest, you know, most broken thing, and you can't miss beauty. Does that make sense? I hope that's your Yes, it did. One. Yes, it did. Um, my favorite part of any one of these is questions. I don't know, are you, will you be oh, okay yeah. if we do that? Sure. Because they tee the ball up for you, and then you can smack it. They will. Can I ask you one more thing before we do that, though? Absolutely. Because... Uh, um, most of you probably know that David produced Johnny Mitchell's debut record. And because I know that you were in that moment uh, very devoted to her artistry and to people hearing it, I wonder if there's something that you might share about how you approached that, because you recognized something very singular happening with this young artist, and you, were, you took on the process of framing it you know, for all time. And I wondered what, what you thought about how you were going to set that table. Well, folk players, and I was a folk player, were playing indicated arrangements. We would try to play part of a bass line, part of a horn section, part of a arpeggio that a keyboard might be doing. We would try to indicate all that stuff on a guitar. Johnny is arguably the best singer-songwriter of our times. Uh, she's as good a poet as Bob. Old weird Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a much better musician than he is. He'll tell you that, too. So I found her in a, in a coffee house, and I walked in, and she was singing, I don't know, Michael from Mountains, or Both Sides Now, or you know one of those songs. And I just went, oh. Holy shit. And uh, I knew that she was doing that already, that it, she wanted to make a record, and I, my biggest job was to keep everybody off it, because it was already there. She was playing the arrangement that it needed brilliantly. It was brilliant shit in tunings, just like mm -hmm. both of us sick people, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, brilliantly. And uh, I think that's, there were two things I had to do, was catch it, keep her from being intimidated, catch it, catch what she was actually doing, and keep everybody else off. Mm -hmm. I think I got let, 
the only person I let on that record was Stephen playing bass on that one song, and it needed the bass. It was right. Mm. But <clears throat> sometimes that's your job. Sometimes it's it, your job is to listen to what's there and say, you know, that doesn't need fuck all. It doesn't. You listen to it and you say, ah, oh, that's there. That's that's right and true, and the song's being served. Our job is to serve the song. Always. Underline that. Print it in large flaming letters. Our job is to serve the song. And that's what I did. And uh, I, I didn't even sing on it. You know how bad I wanted to sing on that shit? <laughs> Can you figure that out? Do I like singing harmony? Are you fucking kidding? I kept myself off that record. Because it was there. It was already there. And sometimes that's our job. Sometimes mm -hmm. to listen to it and say, oh, capture that crystal. Wham. Mm -hmm. Got it. Drop it into a nice mastering job and put it out there. Don't fuck with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some, every don't you find every single record takes a slightly different way of going about it? I mean, that's, sure. that's why you have so many tools in your box, sure. right? It's because mm -hmm. there's there is no formula for it. There are certain truths that we know. You have to have something really to start with, real stuff, a real person singing real stuff that makes you feel something. Okay, you have to catch it sonically well. Those are truths. Pretty much immutable. Uh, but there isn't a formula. At least I don't have one. I don't think he does either. You, you sort of have to keep your head open for what might happen. It's a big deal. Because if you do it right, something really might happen. If you get people like Frizzell, like Greg Lees, like yeah, half a dozen guys we can think of that are just right. They're just right. They right as rain. You know, they really know what they're doing. You get those people in a room, and it's very high likelihood that something's going to happen, that the music's going to come along. And we go, <laughs> and you can go, ah, whoo, gotcha. <laughs> you know, but you got to stay open. I, I love doing it. I love making records. I mean, ever since the record companies didn't understand the word, the word digital, Records don't, win. you don't make records to make money. They didn't get what that word meant. They thought it was like eight track. They hadn't a clue and they didn't realize that, you know, enough generations of analog and it was crap. But the thousandth digital copy is exactly like the first one. So now you make a CD, everybody can copy it for their friends. We don't make a dime off records. I don't make any money off of records. None. Zero. And with streaming, shit, if Spotify played one of my tunes a thousand times, I might be able to buy you a cup of coffee. We make records because they're going to last for fucking ever. They're going to last longer than we will. They're like carving a statue. It's going to stay there. So you really want to do it right. And you really want to catch something magical. And it's not about the money. That's not why we do it at all anymore. Not at all. I mean, you can be, you know, Taylor Swifty or somebody and sell eight million copies of some overproduced piece of junk. And yeah, and, you know, they make money. We don't. Not really. We make that art because it's going to last and because it moves people which is what art's supposed to do. And uh, I think that's that's the one of the main things I would want to communicate to you, is that's what it's really about. You, you can make art that somebody will come up to you 10 years later and say, man, that song just, the song still just makes me cry when I listen to it. It's a really righteous piece of stuff. And you go, oh, wow. You know, you feel like you're validified. You feel like your purpose in life is working. Mm -hmm. And and if if I got any you know thing to tell you, it's that it's a joy to do, and it's not easy. 
Um, let's let's try some questions. Let's see what you got. <laughs> I have a question. So both of you are talking, and I certainly understand about the magic that happens in a room with the right players in the right environment. Yet I'm also reminded of Strawberry Fields Forever, songs in our history where there's a hundred takes, and you're you're listening to the progression um, of or Steely Dan. You were talking about you know where things aren't done live in a room and parts are replaced and stuff. I mean, I find for me, as I get older, I'm much more interested in the mistakes and the things when I was younger, I was obsessed about perfection. There isn't just one way to do it. We talked about what's our favorite yeah. way. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how to work that way that they made stronger. I've never had the luxury of that, and maybe because I didn't, um, and because the music that spoke to me the most as recorded pieces, I understood where where done really quickly, you know, whether it was uh, Lead Belly or Lightning Hopkins or whether it was Highway 61 or, 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 uh, or Kind of Blue, um, that there was something really immediate that I continued to come back to and there was an immediacy that, that, that sounded alive to me. I know there's a lot of beautiful music, you know, um, that, that has been, you know, done piece by piece and, and created by people who have that kind of vision and, and the luxury of that kind of time. But I always just, you know, because of the music that I loved and the resources I had, I always try to find a way to, you know, 99% of, of the record is, you know, happens in that moment, you know, in that, in that one seance. That's our, um, that's our favorite yeah. way to do it. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not to say the other ways aren't valid. The Beatles, who arguably at that moment <clears throat> had all the time and money in the world, I was there at uh, Abbey Road when they were making Sgt. Pepper. And I came in one night and they were particularly crazy. And it's possible that we were high. <laughs> <laughs> and they sat me down on a stool. And Abbey Road then had these speakers that were the size of coffins on, stood up on their ends on rollers. And they wheeled two of them up on either side of me. I was a little intimidated. And I was, okay, I'll fess up. I was high. I was high enough to be hunting geese with a rake. <laughs> I bet you caught a few. I was ripped. And I sat down on the stool, and uh, they told me at the time, and I think it was true, that uh, I was the first person they played Dan the life for. And I got to the end of it, and my brain threw out my nose in a puddle on the floor. And, uh, and I have to say, yes, you can put shit together slowly and make something that will freak you right the fuck out. <laughs> and it did. And I've heard it. And I've heard, I love Steely Dan records. I love them. I eat them for lunch. I rub them in my hair. <laughs> I love Steely Dan. I, I worship Fagan as a writer, and I, I love their records. Okay, and they they are very meticulous, and they do not just get in there and get a quick moment, but they know a take when they hear it. If they were here right now, if Becker was sitting right there, he'd say, oh, that one. And they do build it differently than we both like to, but they, you know, there isn't just one route. There isn't just one road up the mountain. Next question. There also seems to be a, um, more and more common now with singers and songwriters where they'll put out two versions. They'll put out a, a real produced version with a lot of instrumentation in it, and there's an acoustic stripped down version. Sometimes they both work. They both are really interesting. I'm just wondering. If sure. Well, there's all kind of ways a song can be successful, as I said before. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, you know, the strength and weakness of the digital age is that, you know, you can you can put out anything you want. You can upload it on the internet and you can have every version of everything. And then, and the downside is that, is that people, uh, aren't committed to choices. Um, it, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've fallen over, over many things that, you know, I heard an alternate take, a bootleg of something that was, you know, uh, that illuminated what I'd always known of the official version in a different way that was important to me. I don't disparage any of that. But I do think that, that after the, the CD boom happened, 
you know, there was this, you know, because I can put 20 songs in an album, I should put 20 songs in an album. And it, and it inclines people not to make real choices about what this statement might be. Um, on the other hand, you know, I've certainly been on a panel or something where, uh, I remember once a, you know, a music journalist, you know, railing about, you know, like the detriment of the fact that now any, any kid with a laptop can sit in his basement and make an album. And I said, yeah, but you know what the upside of that is? Any kid with a laptop can sit in his basement and make a, make a record and he doesn't need your permission to do it. He doesn't mm-hmm. need your mm-hmm. approval. Mm-hmm. You know, here, here. Um, you know, it may or may not speak to you, uh, you know, when it surfaces. But nobody should decide in advance that that young person who is trying to rub two sticks together doesn't have something of value to offer. Um, I know that took your question somewhere else. Um, somebody else? Yeah, I'm a, um, I consider myself a small-time operator. I produce music, and um, occasionally I have people come in who I feel like have lots of talent, and they sit on the couch when we're talking about how we're going to start this process, and they say, I'm a perfectionist. And I immediately say, I don't know how to get there. That's because there's, there is no such thing. Exactly. So I, 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 I want your kind of thoughts on that. Well, you know, and he knows, and everybody here knows, you, there is no such thing as perfection. So, but how, how do you bring these people, you know, how oh, do you bring them to You smack them in the face with it like a fish. <laughs> well, what I do is typically take the pencil out of my ear and put it back down on the table and say, I can't help you. You yeah, say, yeah. there isn't such a thing as perfection, there's magic, and there's not magic. And, and maybe excellence. And or, excellence. Oh, there's all kinds of ways that can be, I mean, or you just say, you know, you do understand that we're all going to die. <laughs> Um, and once you understand that there's that there's, there's that eventuality that we are mortal beings, that this idea of perfection that you may be carrying around is absolutely uh, not, not not only is it is it completely false, it doesn't exist, but it's a distraction from anything that might be real. Yeah. And, and then like, what you do is you play him a Lightning Hopkins record and you say, if his B string was in tune, would that move you more? Exactly. Exactly. No, it, or you could call either one of us, or both of us, which is kind of excessive, yeah. and have us talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> they will not be real happy afterwards. But uh, uh, Charlie, I'm a uh, huge Rodney Crow fan, mm. and I know he came to you with the uh, project Sex and Gasoline. Yeah. And he being an accomplished uh, producer in his own right, I'm wondering how that process went since he turned the reins over to you. Well, he's a He's a dear, uh, open-hearted man. I mean, he just is. And he showed up and said, look, I need to fire myself as producer. He had made a version of that record. He'd spent a lot of money doing it, and he was really unhappy with it. It felt it did not feel like a living thing to him. So somehow he got a hold of me, and I don't know who put my name in his ear. We had a phone conversation, and then he came out from Nashville to my house and had dinner. And he just said, look... I, I'm going to go play a handful of shows and I'm going to arrive on your doorstep, you know, you know, with an overnight bag and a guitar. And I, and I just want to be the singer. Would you just do, take these songs and, 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 you know, do what you do with them, you know, put a light on them. Um, and there were moments in the making of that record where he really struggled with himself. I was never unhappy with his struggling because he always owned it. You know, he always said, you know, this is about me learning to let go of what I thought should happen so I can hear. Like Joseph Campbell said, you know, you got to let go of the life you imagine so you can have the life that's actually waiting for you. You know, he said, I need to stop thinking about, you know, I already tried what I thought had to happen and it's dead to me. So he said, I just need to be the singer and I need need you to help me be the singer. Um I just made an, another record. I mean, I just made the new record with he and uh, Emilio Harris together. And Rodney's a completely liberated artist in a way that I'm not sure he's ever been. As a writer, a singer, as a record maker, um, I think he got himself really free. Um, and any idea he had in the 80s, which he uh, cops to, where he was trying to make something that he believed to be perfect, um, you know, he now sees that as sort of, even though it, it bought his house, um, I wouldn't argue with him. Um, it's it's musically not alive for him. Um, yeah, he's out on a different wire now. In Emmy Lou of Peach. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, please. I almost saw her. I told you he was stoned. I told you I saw him. <laughs> sure. Not at all. It's, mm. This is all his fault. Uh, 
flip side of the coin for David here. Yeah. Uh, your legendary colorful vocals on Baker Street, on Uncovered, uh, Sean Colvin's latest produced by Stuart Smith. Uh, would you have produced that any differently, or what was it like going through that production process? I would have got more me on there. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, you, you touched a nerve there. Sean is one of, I think, one of the best in the world. I love her. I think she makes, makes fantastic records. I think she's a brilliant writer, singer, player. Absolutely freaking terrific on every level. And I love her. She's a really good person. And uh, the only thing I would have changed was, you know, put me on more tunes. Mm. Uh, she took Baker Street to another place. I'll tell you an interesting thing. When she played it for me, we got to the chorus, and I went right to the, the part that's on the record, on the hit. <clears throat> I, was, I sang it, and I was watching her. You know, when you sing on other people's records, which I do really a lot, you, you learn to, like, read little clues, you know. And I could see that that wasn't what she wanted. And that's how it went. We, she pulled me away from there, and... and as she had done, found a whole new way to sing that song, pulled me into a place where I sang something completely different than was on the record. She's fun, man. If you don't know about Sean, listen to her. She's totally fantastic. Uh, I know that uh, as kind of a spin-off of your first solo record was the legendary Paro Sessions. <laughs> And I feel obliged to ask it because I've been listening to the, the rough mix Barncart did for years. I know there's something in there that's really special, although it wasn't clearly finished. Where, who owns that, or what? I do. So uh, you could actually do something. What like happened that. is, I need to back up a little bit. I don't mean to throw a cloud over this, but my girlfriend had been killed in a wreck. The only place I could exist was in the studio. I got in there with a bunch of songs, and these friends of mine, Garcia, Kantner, Grace, Joni, Nash, people came without much plan. People from Santana, people from Airplane, people from Dead, people from Quicksilver, Freiburg, <clears throat> just came. They all knew I was hurting. They all knew that I was in there, and then I had a handful of songs, and I was staying in there. I practically slept there. And um, when I had the record that I wanted to make, by that time, I was sort of brave enough to come out and kind of look at, look at the world and say, okay, i got to live here anyway. So have some breakfast and go for a walk. And um, everybody had been having so much fun. We had a lot of fun. Admittedly, we were a little loose, but we had a lot of fun. And, uh, and there were pieces of things, like Mountain Song, that Jerry and I were fucking around with, that were very promising. And Kantner thought up the idea of Planet Earth Rock and Roll Orchestra. You know, he's, he's like that. And um, he called them that, all these scraps. And he, you know, I, I, it was kind of like open source stuff. They all had, had tapes and everybody knew what we were doing. And we were, we were very un... We didn't feel a lot of proprietary, you know, ownership of stuff because it was so openly generated between so many of us. And um, so he called it Planet Earth Rock and Roll Orchestra and, and somebody made tapes and let them out. Uh, to me, there was nothing finished there, nothing. The stuff that I really wanted on the record, the only thing that didn't go on the record in the first place was Kids and Talks. And uh, I should have put it on the record on the first record going out because it's really good. That was the only finished piece that should have gone on, on uh, if I could only remember my name, but to me. Nobody else?
Uh, if we have the time, I'm curious if you can talk to working with bands as opposed to working with singer-songwriters, and especially uh, trying to create that same space where if a band feels like they're stayed in a, in a spot in a song, how do you break that up and let them imagine a new place for it to go? Well, I've had less experience doing that than working with solo artists, but certainly when I was um, working with Elvis Costello and, and they weren't called the attractions, they were the imposters by this point after Bruce Thomas left. But I had to sort of walk into it understanding that I was joining you know, a 30-year marriage in progress and that I was not going to turn the tide. You know, I, if I, I would be a lifeguard, um, but I wasn't going to... There was a certain part of their dynamic that I... It was not appropriate for me to try to change. I just needed to try to understand it. Um, and, you know, trying to offer a thought that might, you know, turn their whole ship a little bit rather than picking any individual in that configuration and trying to change their uh, dynamic. But sort of talking to them as if they were a an entity, because they are, and really respecting the fact that this is a marriage that they, they are dedicated to. And... You know, even Elvis being the the you know leader with no in, in no uncertain terms, and and the writer, um, I still tried really hard to think of them because they arrived as a unit um, to to treat them you know with equal respect and and talk to them as a unit. But um, that was very unique to that dynamic, and and I've certainly worked with other bands before where the whole thing is is you know a little bit of, you know divide and conquer because maybe the the marriage is is a bit dysfunctional and you're not doing them any favors by allowing that dysfunction to be the dominant uh, atmosphere in the room. You have to be smart about being able to step outside of their mm -hmm. dynamic and see them more clearly than they. It doesn't. It, it, it didn't hurt anything that I was a parent. You know, you learn a lot about um, <laughs> exactly uh, parenting You're, by by I mean uh, by producing by by trying to parent the, a teenage girl, for instance. The biggest tool you got in an established band like that is to filter the material. Right. Just say, try this. You haven't played anything like this, and try to elicit a response from. It's still them. about the song, yeah. How do you keep them thinking about that as opposed to their you know yeah. whatever's going on in their in their in their bus? You know? Somebody else. <laughs> You guys talk about, David, you talked at the beginning about kind of wait for the muse and a song, uh, wait for the muse to bring you a song, but doing the work to be there when it comes. And Joe, you talked about like how Madame George is still with you after all this time. Um, so the situation is you got your few days, you've got an individual that has great songs, you've got these great players, you've got like Belarus and Greg Lee's there, and, but you're still, you know, it's like, it's not, the light's not shining on it. So do you have any, like, how do you, use like the element of surprise or what, what's something you can do to like what I do in the work, mm. what, what I do is it. I'll try it three times maybe four I'll say you know, let's go on to another two come back to this with fresh heads because if you try to pound it into the ground trying to make it, you can't legislate magic into being it just doesn't do that it's a chemistry and it and you can nudge it, you can you can try to elicit it, but you can't make it happen. So if I don't hear it or I don't feel it pretty quickly, I, I say, let's do another tune, put our heads in another place. Let's try this again tomorrow. And sometimes you, you try a thing six different days and you don't get it. And on the seventh day, something happens. But you can't really pound that square pig into a round hole. It's not going to happen. Somebody else? Yeah. Can I, can I just add before we really quickly, another thing that really works is to just invite people away from their stations, you know, their headphones, their mixes. They're all trying to, to translate what's happening very naturally in the room, you know, into a very private space. And frequently, if we hit any wall at all, I just say, everybody just come into the main, just stay in the room. Like when I was, I had been working with Bonnie Red in my basement at home. Um, just if anything was sort of just not, Connecting, I would just say, Bonnie, just just bring an acoustic guitar, and we would stand in a circle around her, literally as close as I am to David. Just will you just sing the song and get us back to what made you want to sing it in the first place? And maybe Jay Beller was standing there and he's playing his thighs, and I go, well, there's the song. Um, so knowing that there's, it's in the room now. Just go back in front of microphones and just play that. That's why and, he's a good producer. You know. <laughs> Guys, one more. 
Sure. Who, who, who did he call on? I'm sorry. I, I derailed it. Yeah, I had, uh, I think you just answered my question. I was going to say both of, both of your productions get to the spine of the song really fast. I was going to ask how you did that. I think you anticipated that with what you just said. Yeah. One more? Somebody? Is there a cowboy song you like and what is it and why? <laughs> You know, I, I would have bet money that nobody could have asked me a question that would stop me in my tracks. Uh, Ghost Riders in the Sky. Uh, Jack Elliott doing uh, Woody Guthrie's Buffalo Skinners. Yeah, there's a valid one. I've seen several artists who tour with a guitar or two guitars, and they tour solo, and that's how they perform live. And then when they put out their album, there's always a band, and the sound is very polished. Is that the artist's choice? Is it the producer's choice? Why do they make that choice? Sometimes it's just because that's how things are normally done. You know, you bring in a whole band, and sometimes it's because the producer isn't, isn't smart enough to really listen to the person playing acoustically by themselves, like I talked about with Joni. Sometimes uh, it's one of those two mistakes. Well, I would just say it's different all the time. Sometimes that person on the road with one other guitar player or alone, it's about economics, not because that's how they hear their songs most alive. Um, but, you know, I, live performing and, and recording records, uh, one frequently facilitates the other, but they're not the same pursuit. I mean, playing live is very much like doing live theater. It's immediate mistakes and all, whatever you perceive mistakes to be, have to become a fabric and a dynamic of that performance. Being in the studio is like making movies. And you get to play on illusion, you get to spend a little bit more time thinking about how to, how to get that deep focus that Orson Welles you know, pioneered and, and create a bit more dynamic, you know, broader than the, than the room you might be sitting in if you're playing a live show. So again, you know, sometimes those things are really linked and the person you know, going out on tour to represent that record is going to do it just like that record because that's how they hear it. Other times they might say, well, I've recorded that, so there's an idea I don't have to babysit anymore. So what else can it be? How naked can it be and still be alive? And I'll pocket everybody else's per diem and that will be a win-win. Sometimes it's not a good thing because you wind up doing something in a studio with a band that you can't do live by yourself. I happen to really love playing live by myself. And there are songs off of that last record I made, Cross, that my son produced. It's a good record. I like that record. And there's tunes on there. I can't play live acoustic by myself. And I wish I could. So I think maybe I made a little bit of a mistake there. I should have made sure that there was an acoustic version that I could indicate all the stuff that happened on that record. I like that record. I love there's songs on there I'd love to be able to play live. So we got to call it a college thing because uh, there's other people and other stuff. Um, it's an honor doing this with you, man. You're an Thank articulate you, motherfucker. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.